Um, one of the things we did to improve the, uh, the first talk was we put a link up here uh, to Open One Labs where you can actually go in, uh, and, and basically view the slideshow um, as we're going through it. So if you go to that link, you can pull down. It's an index HTML file, and um, you'll be able to click through the slideshow with us. We did this in Reveal.js, which is a, um, it's a combination of Markdown and JavaScript to do it, so it's all web-based, browser-based. So um, we are going to be going through some graphs, some sequence diagrams. I think it was a little bit difficult uh, for folks to kind of see those from back in the room, so this would be a way for you to view it up close and personal. And that's kind of the, uh, the introduction piece of that, the administrivia. Um, I am Brad Palm, and to my left is? Uh, Brian Granke. All right, so Brian and I um, are both in the Marine Corps, currently active duty. I'm just getting ready to get out here in the next month. And um, this Venn diagram is kind of a uh, conglomeration of both of us here. So we're going to start on the right-hand side on the professional side of the Venn diagram. And up in the top right is kind of the, the symbol for combat engineers. I, I grew up in the Marine Corps as a combat engineer responsible for demolition, mobility, counter-mobility, and uh, all kinds of construction type tasks. So I come from the world of blowing things up and building them back up. And Brian, what do you do? So I'm a communications officer, which uh, means we like wander out in the middle of the desert and start building communication networks out there. So we start off with a bare patch of sand, we build up a, uh, you know, put power, stand everything up, and you know, 24 hours later you have internet and phone access out there, uh, which is kind of, the, the reason that we've gotten into this space and why the current topic of blockchains is interesting for us because it's kind of this uh, interesting concept of being able to build very, uh, you know, provide and promise this very resilient and capable uh, technology. So, you know, coming from a building and, you know, in that construct, and then we've both done a lot of security work, so kind of an offensive and destructive mindset, this is an interesting kind of bridging of the spaces. Yeah, that's a great point. So currently we both work at a uh, testing facility where we do network analysis, um, and then uh, we'll just kind of call it just some generic penetration testing, looking at systems kind of from a black box approach. So that's kind of where, uh, where we make our money now. So kind of shifting left, um, throughout our time with that team that we just kind of discussed, that testing team, uh, we leverage open source tools heavily. And as network analysts, of course, Wireshark is our go-to, and that's kind of the focus point of our open source kind of research and uh, support kind of participation. But we do a lot of different stuff. We do a lot, a lot of different security-focused stuff. Um, definitely within uh, Security Onion, a lot within Kali Linux, um, heavy Linux shop. And um, that's kind of led us into looking at all kinds of different technologies. I did a lot of work with DARPA doing mesh networking, so I have a, a passion for mesh networks, how to uh, solve some of the difficult problems that we might bring up today that, uh, that involves with a distributed network. And, um, so that's kind of our, our center, our focus that bleeds over into our personal lives. So Brian and I are self, uh, self-proclaimed nerds, you know, confession time. And uh, on our free time, we definitely take some time out of uh, our busy schedules to tinker and play around. So besides getting outdoors and getting after it with our family and friends, uh, go to the next slide here. This is Brian and I with a bottle of whiskey building some mining rigs on the weekend. So we definitely get after it and uh, like to geek out. And I'll just kind of call your attention to a couple of the GPUs slapped across the top there on this rig. That's going to be an important concept when we come into um, kind of the brute force approach to how you break or solve problems in the cryptography space. So GPUs are very good at that, and we'll kind of plant that seed now and continue that thread throughout the rest of the presentation. And I'll let you take it over, Brian. Yeah, so first we're going to kind of cover just some overarching and high-level concepts of what makes blockchains blockchains. Uh, it's kind of a very different construct than a lot of other systems and software and technology that uh, may have come, come out of the past, and there's some new, new constructs there. Um, so we'll talk about what the traffic looks like coming out of, out of in between, within, uh, used in these systems, uh, and show you guys some sequence diagrams and some pack, uh, capture pack, pack, packet captures with that. And then why is this important? What, uh, what, types, of, what types of this stuff might you see on your network? Might, why might you see it there, and what can you do about it? So starting off, um, what is a blockchain? Um, it's a, a blockchain's really, it's not a new technology in and of itself per se. It's kind of an interesting combination of existing and previously created technologies. So, uh, it, you know, a lot of it's riding on top of TCP network traffic. It's not the protocols aren't anything terribly, uh, terribly new and novel. It's using you know public key cryptography, uh, same stuff a lot of uh, a lot of us have seen before in the past, um, and you know the software is you know, written in Go or C or whatever, whatever uh, flavor of your choice may be. So nothing there is that, that, that interesting. But what's interesting is how they combined some of these things together to solve some interesting and kind of current problems in technology space. So how do you do uh, you, trustless network consensus? How do you do 
um, you know, decentralized, um, decentralized com computations and things like that. So th the key there is that it's, it's n nothing terribly new. It's just kind of an interesting combination of ex previously existing technologies. So first, I want to kind of differentiate between some of the semantics and some of the terms you might have heard. So you know, if you, look, you open up a newspaper or look online, you're going to see a lot of, a lot of news articles about specifically Bitcoin and blockchain and how these things are going to revolutionize and, you know, how uh, drug dealers are using blockchain technology and stuff like that. So just to differentiate between the terms, um, I kind of want to start off with this high-level concept of, you know, distributed and decentralized uh, technology. So you got software that's, you know, geographic, geographically or logically uh, separated from one another and it needs to talk to each other and come to some sort of consensus and it may or may not be decentralized. So kind of an interesting example of that that everybody's heard of is, is BitTorrent. Uh, blockchain is a subset of that. It's um, most of the time, and if for, for kind of intents and purposes of this presentation, it's, it's de distributed and decentralized. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but to gain most of the benefits or most of the interest out of this thing, it will be. And then you have something like a cryptocurrency, which may ride on, the top, of, which may ride on top of blockchain technology, but it doesn't necessarily have to. So Bitcoin's an example of that. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, which means it's a, a digital currency. Um, if you think about something like when you, when you conduct a bank transaction uh, with somebody maybe who's using the same bank as you, there's probably not any cash or anything changing hands or moving around physically. It's, you know, an, a digital update somewhere in a ledger. Um, and that's essentially kind of what Bitcoin is too, but it's just built on top of this blockchain construct, which is, you know, it's distributed and decentralized. A kind of an alternative example to that is something like Ethereum, which isn't necessarily a digital currency, but it's still built on, it's a platform built on top of a blockchain that allows you to do uh, it's a Turing complete machine, which allows you to do, build contracts and build kind of software on top of a blockchain. Then you have something like a, a nano cryptocurrency, which is a cryptocurrency, but it's not using a blockchain um, underlying structure. It's using a different type of data structure with it. So the terms are very, very often related, and they're um, often combined together, but they're not necessarily the same thing. So if, if you're hearing these terms, you may want to uh, just kind of think about specifically what level you're, think, uh, you're hearing at at this point. Do you have something there? Um, I was going to yeah, ask and, you if you could kind of just real quickly talk what Nano does and what Ethereum does, just kind of get some context. Yeah, so, so for example, you know, like I said, Bitcoin and Nano are both cryptocurrencies. If you want to, you know, their intended purpose is to be used as a digital, as a digital currency. Um, Ethereum, as a difference, is a meant, it's a platform that allows you to, to write, <laughs> essentially write software, it's often used as a kind of a contract. So if you're writing like a legal contract or something like that, it allows you to do this in a decentralized and distributed nature. Um, and it has some similar characteristics to, to Bitcoin and some of these other ones, but um, its purpose is not necessarily as a digital currency. Um, and uh, we, got, we got a small group here today, so if anybody, if any of the topics I'm touching on need a little bit of clarification or you want some additional explanation, just stick your hand up and I think we'll be okay to kind of answer those as ho ad hoc as we go along here. So um, to get a little bit more in the weeds on this, at a high level, um, a blockchain is uh, a linked list of data with a cryptographic reference to previous data. So if you think about a linked list as a data structure, um, it's, a, it's a piece of data that has a reference to a previous piece of data. In this instance, we're gonna start off kind of looking at this, this first block where there's a piece of data in there. It's the very first one, it has a timestamp, and it has a reference to nothing because it's the first one. And the second one is a second piece of data. Um, it has a timestamp slightly later than the first one, and that reference there is essentially a hash of the previous block. You take all the data from block one, you hash it, and you put that reference into block two. And just to uh, you know, make sure we're eating our cryptographic vegetables here, just to cover what hashing is, hashing is this one-way function. It's, a, um, it's very easy to compute with uh, given a piece of data. It's very easy and uh, not, not expensive to compute a hash of a, of a, uh, a piece of data. But it's one way. It's very expensive, if, if not impossible, to take a hash and recreate the data out of that. Um, and secondly, it's very easy to compare. So you take a data, you hash it, you take a data, take the same data again, and you hash it again, and you're going to get the same exact answer. And that becomes important as you move along uh, this, type of, this type of structure. So as block two um, has a hash of block one, and block three is essentially taking the, same taking the data from block two, including that hash of block one, and including reference to that in block three. So, as this chain grows, you're going to notice that it becomes, you know, it becomes increasingly linked back. So if I were to try to go back and change some data in block one, I'd have to then change that hash in block two, which is a reference to block one, which means that block three would be invalid. 
so on and so forth. And as this thing grows longer, it becomes increasingly more complex and expensive to uh, recreate data from the beginning or go back and change data. The second concept we're going to talk about here is something called proof of work. And this is where that, um, uh, that mining rig that, that Brad and I showed you earlier kind of comes into play. So proof of work in this construct is nothing more than a, a brute forcing of, of hashes. So like I mentioned earlier, it's, 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 uh, it's a, it's a one-way function, and the other kind of key characteristic of it is it's random. So if you want to try to get a resulting hash value out of a piece of data, you really have no, until you conduct the actual execution, you have no idea what your hash value is going to look like. So what, uh, what, what blockchains are doing is they're saying, we want you to find a, not a specific hash value, not an equal to hash value, but a less than hash value. So if you think about a hash as a representation of a numeric value, we want you to find a hash value that is less than 10 million, or the kind of easier way to explain it is we want to find a hash value that starts with some number of leading zeros. So a kind of an interesting example of this is an older piece of software that was called HashCash. And the idea behind this was to help prevent spam in emails. So if you're going to send somebody an email, there's a, and you're using, you know, kind of a general purpose laptop, and uh, the idea is I'll choose an arbitrary value that it'll take you uh, one second to brute force a hash value that starts with two zeros using your, using your general purpose laptop. So you take your email, you hash the entire contents of your email, and you come up with some resulting hash. And it's probably not going to start with two zeros. So what you do is you add a little bit of randomness to your email. You just generate a nonce, and you hash it again. And it, maybe, maybe or maybe it doesn't start with two zeros. And you repeat this enough times until you have a, have a ha resulting hash value that starts with two zeros. And if you do your math right and you figure two two zeros is going to take you about one second to generate this hash value. Then you attach the hashed, uh, hashed, the successful hash, the nonce, and the message of your email, and you send that off. And if Brad receives that, he can very quickly and inexpensively check, check that in you know, one millisecond or whatever. So it takes me one second to send it. It takes one second for Brad to verify that somebody has taken one second to generate this email. Well, that doesn't cost me you know, anything to send Brad one email. If I'm a spammer and I'm just generating this a million times, it becomes prohibitively expensive for me to send emails. So this idea is, was taken from that and has been used in, uh, in blockchains now to essentially validate, those validate blocks. So those hash values, um, you add another field in there that essentially is a nonce inside of that, that block. And I'll get into a little bit later into why that is, why that is important. But long story short, uh, proof of work is nothing but brute forcing random generation of nonces to solve a specific, a specific pattern for a hash. So uh, it's kind of easy to think about this as an example. So I'm, uh, I want to start a new, a new Bitcoin. I'm going to call it Brian coin or something, right? And since I'm, I'm a cool guy, I feel like I'm entitled to a little bit of freebie. I'm going to give myself three coins to start off with. Um, so nobody sent me this. I just got it on my own because I created the software. I took a, you know, went on GitHub, I forked Bitcoin, and now I have Brian coin. So uh, I did that at, you know, 1300 yesterday. I decide that, you know, my buddy Fred here, he's, uh, he wants to participate in this too. So I'm going to just, I'm just going to send him some coins. So he, he, you know, he creates his own, uh, essentially I'll, I'll get into it, a, a wallet here, and um, I'm able to send him two coins. So I create a data structure that says, you know, from Brian to Fred, amount two, and I take a reference to that previous block. So I hash block one, and I take a reference. If you do the mathematics on the transactions within the blockchain, you can tell now that I've sent two to Fred, so I have, have one remaining, Fred has two. And that thing on our right is what you may hear the term is ledger, which is nothing more than a computation across the data store within the blockchain. I do that one more time. Uh, Fred decides that he wants to send some, uh, one of Brian coins to, to, to Brad. So, you know, data's, data's updated, sender, Sender Fred, recipient Brad, amount one. Block three contains a hash of block two, including the hash of block one. And now if you do the mathematics across the, across the, uh, the data in there, you can see the ledger's updated and everybody has you know, one coin. An interesting part comes into play now. If I wanted to go back and I wanted to say, you know what, I didn't actually send Fred three coins. I only sent him one. And I'm storing, you know, I'm storing a copy of this information on my computer. Brad's storing a copy on his computer. So theoretically, I can go in there and I can change it. What happens then is I've changed that block, uh, block two information, and all of a sudden, the hash 
is going to be different of that block. So I need to go in and change the hash in block three. And if I change the hash in block three, I need to go change the hash in block four. And again, as this, as this expands further and further down, it becomes more challenging to go back and try to recreate that data, which gives that term that uh, is used within is an immutable data structure. Can I try and grab the slides real quick? Yeah. Yep. So, um, so as we're kind of talking through what a blockchain is, it's kind of interesting to know who's participating in this. So again, a blockchain is nothing more than software stored across multiple, multiple systems. So anybody, sorry about that. There. All right, so blockchain is nothing more than software stored across multiple computers. And um, so, that, which means that anybody or anything can kind of interact with this. All you gotta do is you know, download a copy of the software. So people can interact with it, uh, software can interact with it, hardware devices can interact with it. Uh, it could be you know, an, an Internet of Things device which reads an RFID tag on a shipping container and stores some GPS data out to the blockchain so that it can be you know, immutably stored, you can keep an immutable record of where this shipment has gone. Uh, again, it could be somebody who just wants to send a, a digital currency to somebody else, or it could be somebody who just wants to read information and passively analyze it. So, um, again, a lot of this stuff, Bitcoin, for example, is an easy one to talk about. This, it's, it's public accessible. You can go, you can fire it up on your computer right now, and you can download a transaction history of anybody who's ever sent anybody else Bitcoins. And you can get that data on your computer and you can do whatever type of analysis suits you on that. If you're a graph theorist or a network scientist, you can pull that down and try to do you know, some sort of relationship mapping of this stuff. Um, and people are, there's, a big, there's big business now in tools that allow people to do that. So in, in order to interact uh, actively with a blockchain, you're gonna hear people have the term wallet. Um, and a wallet can mean one of any of, any of many things. It can mean you know, a piece of paper that you've written numbers like this down. Numbers like this are just public key cryptography. So a public key and a private key, um, think of something like you would use for email signatures. Public key is public address, something you distribute to other people. It's kind of used to identify you on these networks. And a private address is something that you use personally to digitally you know, sign data or transactions or emails or whatever it is. Um, and uh, it could be anything from, yeah, you write this information down on a piece of paper and it's, it's you know, you, you stick it in your safe somewhere. There's specially made pieces of hardware that can store this stuff for you using, you know, some sort of internal hardware, trusted, you know, computing environment. Uh, there's third-party providers, think of, a, think of like a bank, that'll store this information for you and allow you to, you know, authenticate using usernames and passwords. So you're saying that this is no longer good for holding money anymore, right? It, it can hold your money if you write it down on a piece of paper and store it in there. Okay. The interesting thing is, is you can store um, you know, theoretically, one of these addresses can store the, you know, any amount of, if you're using a currency, any amount of currency you want. So that, that's all it is. That key at the bottom, that's your kind of keys to your kingdom. So that, if you lose, yeah, yes. No. Uh, so I noticed that, like, every time I go to the product, it's also Yep. Every time I go to the So how do you keep a track of that, like... So, okay, so his question was in a lot of it, so this, uh, he, he, uh, he, good lead into the next thing. So a wallet can also mean essentially a piece of software that's running on your computer that helps you manage this type of information. So uh, depending on you know, what software you're using, what system you're using, what blockchain you're using, things are done slightly differently. Um, so for example, you may have one address, one, one key pair that you use for every transaction you make. Some software allows you to create multiple key pairs and multiple transactions to help kind of uh, obfuscate and give you a little more an anonymity or privacy on these things. So some of them are going to be uh, potentially randomly almost looking, randomly generated. So it depends on the software you're using on how you want to manage and keep that. So it depends Ryan. is the answer to that, sorry. Ryan, maybe we go through this example. Am I coming through okay? People can hear me still? Okay, so here's an example of a USB that was you know, taken from the uh, near the reef over there, right across the way for our packets. So you could go through and make this an encrypted USB that only you know the password to, and you could hold your private key on here. And you could also do something where maybe you set up a hot and cold wallet, right? Yep. And essentially you're using one private key to do transactions with an API or a service, but then behind the scenes you're taking the majority of that money and putting it into a cold storage area. Yep. So you kind of have these intermediate layers, almost like an onion, a way of moving funds around the importance of that we'll kind of get into here in the future, but 
Um, really, it's to kind of protect yourself and not be publicly displaying uh, where your funds are allocated and, and what things are moving. So I guess, and, and to further expound on it depends, right, as a definition, you kind of have to do your own threat vector analysis, your own kind of resiliency analysis on how you want to implement your own money system, much like, you know, choosing a good bank or storing all your cash underneath your mattress or something like that. So we could certainly at the end kind of go into some, some lessons learned that we've had and some tips and tricks, uh, but it's a great question and that's kind of why we bring this up is a wallet is an overloaded term and it really actually requires you to think pretty heavily about how you're going to do this. What is your workflow like if you actually were to use, uh, you know, and do a bit Bitcoin transaction or cryptocurrency transaction? It's a great question. So again, yes. Yeah, that, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, you could, you would have, if you have, um, so Brad's example, you have maybe one piece of, uh, you know, one key pair that you store in your safe that, you know, you're never going to use. It's your retirement account, right? Think about it that way. That stays in there, and you, you still know the public address of that. So if you have an account that you're using for daily, day-to-day -day transactions that maybe you're, you generated a separate key pair that you used to buy, you know, coffee at Starbucks with your Bitcoins, um, you have a separate key pair. So if you want to send money to your, other account, it's the same, same type of transaction you'd use to send to anybody else. So digital, you digitally sign, I'll get into that in a few minutes, but yeah, two separate key pairs for two separate uses in, in your specific uh, question there. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, so mo moving on slightly here. Um, so in this, uh, in this construct, a node, the term we're going to use, is really nothing more than a computer which is running an instance of, the, of, of blockchain software. It usually also has an entire copy of all the data that's ever hap happened um, within the blockchain network. And uh, it's connected to, the, um, you know, connected to the rest of its peers or other nodes in the network and is probably exchanging data. Uh, but really, yeah, it's just nothing more than a, a computer running, uh, running the software. So um, in, in many cases, you used to be able to stand up, for example, a Bitcoin node on your laptop. Now it's the, you know, the amount of data has grown to a point where that may no longer be feasible. Uh, but other, you know, blockchains still potentially allow something like that. Uh, the other interesting thing about a node is it's usually, it's uh, kind of the starting point for a lot of stuff. So if I have a wallet running on my laptop that I want to conduct a transaction with, I usually need to connect to a node. So I need to generate some data and then I send it to a node that is uh, connected to the rest of the network. So there's a couple specialized types of nodes. One of those is called a miner. Um, and a miner is nothing more than a node, usually running you know, the blockchain software, but it's also doing that proof of work I mentioned earlier. So in that picture uh, Brad brought up earlier, we had this GPU array connected, you know, built onto a computer. So those GPUs are running. They're, it's, uh, there's software running on there that's talking to the blockchain network and that it's receiving those proof of work problems. So somebody's creating uh, data. They want to send, maybe they want to send some uh, digital currency across the network. A problem that, that, uh, that information is being sent out, and somebody needs to do that brute force work, and that's what miners do. So they get that information, and they start plugging away on it, trying to find that special nonce. So you, depending on the type of difficulty, you know, you may need some instances you can use a, a laptop with a CPU in it. In some instances, you may need a specialized piece of hardware like an ASIC to do this type of stuff. In some instances, you know, GPU arrays are, are appropriate. But the key is it's that very mathematically competent, com, uh, expensive uh, brute forcing process to, to find that special hash. Oh. A pool is another term here, and a pool is an abstraction that kind of helps that proof of work problem. So I'll use an so let's say the, the difficulty uh, created by the network right now is you need to find 10 leading zeros on this hash which is incredibly complex. So if you're running a laptop trying to do this, you're never gonna find that, um, I shouldn't say never. It's uh, improbable that you will find a solution to that problem. So what you can do is you can uh, use a concept of a pool. And a pool just takes that problem and it distributes it. And what they'll do that's kind of interesting is they'll say, rather than solving a problem that requires a leading 10 zeros, we're only gonna require you to solve a problem that has a leading three zeros. So it's gonna send that problem out to, you know, any, let's say there's three miners that are trying to use this pool. So they'll send that problem to miner one. 
and they'll start thinking about it. And they'll send a slightly different problem to minor two and a slightly different problem to minor three. And minor one will churn for a while, and hey, it finds a number that uh, has three leading zeros, so it sends it back to the pool. And the pool's like, great, thanks. Check mark for you. Minor two does the same thing, sends a solution back. Minor three does the same thing, sends a solution back. And it keeps track of all of these. You know, maybe an hour later, all these, all these miners have been spinning around for a while, and they've all submitted some solutions back. Minor one's got double the resources of miners two and three. So it submitted twice as many answers back to, to the pool. And all of a sudden, minor three gets lucky. And it finds a hash that has um, 10, you know, 10 uh, leading zeros on it. And it submits that answer back to the pool. And the pool's like, fantastic, solution found. And it pushes it to the network. The network gives it a reward, which I'll talk about here in a minute. It's essentially you know, a payment for doing this work and working for the network. And the pool takes that reward, and it splits it among the three miners. But it keep, since it's kept track of how much work each miner has done, miner one gets 50% of the reward, and miner two and three only get 25% of the reward. Even though miner three found the problem, by pooling their efforts together, uh, they you know, essentially kind of are sharing the profits and sharing the reward at that point. All right, so now that we've uh, kind of talked through like, what makes up a blockchain, I'll walk through an example transaction. Sorry, Brian. I did it. Oh, sorry. Uh, so how does time play affect this? I know you have to solve a block within a certain amount of time. Yep. Where does that come from, or how is Good question. You're, another good leading question. I'll get into that in one second here. I got, a, I got a slide for it. But yeah, good question. His question was, how, how does time play into this? Like, when is a block formed? How often are blocks formed? How often are these transactions validated? And I'll get into that in one second here. All right, so uh, Brad and I, uh, you know, Brad wants to conduct a transaction with me. I don't know, he wants to buy a surfboard or something from me using, using Bitcoins. I do like to surf. So, so Brad and I have, you know, we've done some mining. We've had our GPU rig stood up for a while. We've each generated ourselves some, some rewards. So we got some Bitcoins in our account. So Brad's, you know, got a public address of Cafe Babe. I got my public address of uh, Dead Beef here. Brad's got five of them because he's been, you know, super successful with his mining and is good at building GPU arrays, and I'm not so great at it. You have to plug it into the wall first. Yeah. <laughs> so, Brad, so Brad creates a transaction that says, hey, I'm going to send uh, to the address Dead Beef. I'm going to generate my, you know, amount I'm going to send him. And I'm going to use my, uh, my private address from my wallet that I've generated to digitally sign this transaction. And I'm going to submit that to a node. So I'm using the software on my laptop. I'm going to submit this to a node. And that you know, was probably pre-programmed or hard-coded into my, into my software, but it could be you know, a bootstrap node of some sort, or it could be just manually input in whatever way you want. So he's, uh, he's digitally signed this thing, and he submitted it to the, to the network. So it's been pushed to, uh, let's call it node A. Node A knows about. Some other, some other uh, nodes running software in this network as well. And it sends an inventory message to each one of these other nodes saying, hey, I got this new information. Hey, I got this new information. Hey, I got this new information. So it's starting to get broadcast and propagated throughout the network. So one of its peers may have another peer that it knows about. Let's call it node B that node A does not. And so it also forwards that message eventually uh, you know, until, I get to your point in a second here, um, until this, the transactions are solved, the block is formed, this, this transaction data is propagated throughout the network. In the example of Bitcoin that he brought up before, the, the idea is, is that one of these things will be found every 10 minutes. So it'll be approximately a 10-minute propagation until a block is formed, maybe a little bit longer, depending on if you got lucky or not and your transaction was included. So, multiple, so Brad and I are doing a transaction. You know, Some other people are doing a transaction on the other side of the country. Some other people are doing transactions on the other side of the country. Rather than submitting every one of these individually to, those mining, to the miners, which would incur a significant amount of overhead in the network, they're kind of batched up into something called a block, which is the formation of the blockchain. So multiple transactions are coming into play. They're propagating throughout the network. They're being rebroadcast, and nodes are eventually receiving multiple transactions. And as they're doing this, they're kind of batching these things together into a block. And to combine this next concept with the previous concept, in order to determine when these blocks are created, it gets back to this concept of difficulty. So difficulty is nothing more than how many zeros do you need at the beginning of that resulting hash? And the network's kind of dynamically creating this, uh, this difficulty level to a pre-programmed level. So like I mentioned before, Bitcoin says, we want to form a block every 10 minutes. So if a node's receiving these transactions and it's trying to, trying to spin up, uh, uh, do its proof of work, do its, do its brute forcing, it's, it's doing it on the transactions that it has. If it finds that information, then that is a block. And the next block that comes in will be, or the next transaction that'll be come in will have to wait. 
um, if it hasn't received a transaction from a previous, uh, something that was already submitted because it hasn't been propagated through the network, it's gonna have to wait, it'll be included in the next block. But as the network's doing this, it's determining, you know, hey, every six minutes right now, we're getting a block done. That means there's too many people running their GPU arrays or ASICs on this network. We need to make it a little bit more hard. So they, they uh, you know, messages go out and the network difficulty is increased. Now instead of 10 zeros, we need 11 zeros at the beginning of our hash. So it makes a little bit more, it makes it a little harder to find this. So it's really, it's, the difficulty is nothing more than a function of hash rate, uh, number of transactions, and hash rate on the network. So the, a miner receives some transactions, it receives a block, uh, it's forming them into blocks, and all of a sudden it needs to start doing its uh, brute force work on these things. So same process we mentioned before, it takes that block data, uh, it starts uh, brute forcing hashes, and if it finds a hash that's less than the difficulty rating, then it uh, sends that information back to the network and that node is, or that block is validated. Uh, once the block is validated, this is the other interesting concept. The person or the you know, machine or pool or whomever that found that valid hash is rewarded. And a reward is nothing more than a, essentially a coin generated out of thin air. So at the beginning, if you remember back, Brad had five coins, I had one. Brad and I conducted a transaction. He gave me one, so he has four and two. And now the miner gets one. Um, it's a contrived example, but that's, you know, it's essentially now there's six coins in the network. So um, most of these, I shouldn't say most, many of these blockchains have some semblance of a fixed number of coins in there or some sort of inflationary uh, functionality going on to minimize or decrease or regulate the amount of uh, generated coins that are happening in these networks. But uh, there's always some sort, or there's usually some sort of a reward associated with finding a transaction or finding a, a, a hash. So that's what a blockchain is. Now let's kind of talk about what it is not. So there's this kind of assumption that a blockchain is inherently anonymous, which is not necessarily true. Some of, it can be with some specialized, uh, you know, software and programming and mathematics involved, but it's not, the, the construct of a blockchain does not make something anonymous. So just because uh, I have that, that long kind of randomly looking string of characters to identify my account, um, if I send something to Brad, and then you go and download that blockchain, you'll be able to find, you'll be able to see that transaction. And let's say I have my blog where I want, I want, you know, some, some people to give me tips for writing good blog posts. And I have at the bottom, and I'm like, hey, donate me some bitcoins for writing some good blog posts. And you see that on there. And let's say you later looking around and you go out, I don't know, the EFF's website. And you're like, I wanna, you know, I wanna make a donation to EFF. And they have a little donate on their bottom of their uh, website. And you wanna download a, copy of the blockchain, and you look in there and you're like, you know, there's Brian's, there's Brian's address, there's EFF's address, I wonder if Brian supports EFF. And you can do a search there and you can see that, you know what, I've just solved the meat space problem. Brian does donate to the EFF because I can see that transaction in the blockchain. There goes, there goes the anonymity of, of, of things like that. Wait, you're saying people are gonna do social network engineering and try and track down where you're spending your money and who you're supporting? Yes. Nobody does that. <laughs> so yeah, there's a ton of tools out there already that exists for this stuff, there's, there's, uh, there's big money involved in, in that exact type of work. So they're not inherently anonymous. People are trying to solve that problem and have uh, solved that problem using other types of um, kind of uh, logic on top of blockchains. You know, Monero is kind of an interesting example of that as a separate cryptocurrency that helps solve this problem. Which leads into the next point. It's also not inherently private. So tied back to the previous point, if um, Brad has on his blog, he has his, his uh, Bitcoin address at the bottom that says donate to me. I can go look it up and I can look at something called a potentially a rich list, which says, you know what, somebody has already done, the, pro done the, the analysis and they put up a website where I can search by address and I can see exactly how many Bitcoins are in that address. So I know Brad, ha or Brad has his, uh, his address on the bottom of his website. He's doing a great job, people are supporting him and I can see that there are you know, 10 Bitcoins in his address. So now all I gotta do is get a wrench and hit him over the head until, until he gives me his private key and I have all of his Bitcoins. I'm getting so some bodyguards. I can tell exactly how much money is in, in his account. So it's not inherently private. Again, people are adding on you know, mathematics and uh, addi additional types of cryptography um, on top of blockchains to solve this problem, but by nature, that it doesn't necessarily solve it. And then lastly, uh, they're not inherently secure. And I'll, I'll uh, explain what I mean by that. So you can write some great code you know, using C and GCC compiler, and you know, you're probably not gonna find any vulnerabilities in the compilation process um, if you write perfect code. But nobody writes perfect code, and you can, really, you can write some pretty crappy code using C programming language. So when you think of things like Ethereum, 
where you can write your own code that rides on top of this, and that code can store some semblance of value, it can become very, very easy to write and create insecure blockchain technologies. And additionally, a lot of this stuff isn't even, uh, it doesn't even have built-in security. So it, you'll, you'll see in some of our captures coming up here that a lot of this stuff is sent across the network in plain text. It has no, it's not using TLS, it's not using any sort of uh, obfuscation or any other sort of network security on here. So it's very susceptible to network type attacks. People are you know, doing BGP hijacking to steal mining funds. You're doing BGP hijacking to, do, um, you know, to, to steal people's credentials for uh, exchanges. They're doing um, you know, DNS hijacking so that they can you know, fish and do all kinds of other interesting things. And once you lose that private key or you've given up that information, there's no recourse for it in, in most instances. So uh, Brad will, will kind of dig in now to some of the weeds of what this uh, stuff actually looks like on the wire. I think you did an awesome job. I'm looking around the room here. You just uh, made everybody eat their cryptographic vegetables this morning. And uh, nobody's fallen asleep yet. So well done, Brian. Well done. Um, so I, I think Brian kind of showed his, uh, his ability to communicate some, some topics from the 30,000 foot view. And he also kind of like hit some turbulence and died down to about 1,000 foot with some pseudocode. So he was kind of all over the spectrum for you, which is one of the skills he brings to the table. He, he's able to kind of parse really dry, really boring mathematical white papers that, that leverages stuff, and he's able to kind of put it into practice and talk about it. Now, if you visit his, uh, his blog site that uh, we initially were hosting this from in the beginning, Open One Labs, he's actually gone out and written some articles from Monero and different folks on kind of breaking this down and doing implementation. So I want to tip your hat to you. You do an excellent job with explaining it, so thank you. So now to kind of tie this into to our world, into the analyst world, we're going to look at uh, some captures. In order to do these captures, what we did was uh, Brian fired up a Docker container that had the, uh, the Bitcoin software on it, also the Monero software. We're going to focus primarily on Bitcoin for this, for this portion right here, and that's because there's already this sector built out in Wireshark for Bitcoin. So Monero isn't quite following the spec that Bitcoin has laid out. They're very close, but the parsers aren't quite there yet. So for, for readability, we're going to stick with uh, the sector that Wireshark currently has. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at three different types of traffic. We're going to look at peer-to-peer, we're going to look at API and mining. API and mining leverage the JSON remote procedure call, the RPC. So JSON RPC is, the, uh, is what they're writing on top of. And mining is leveraging stratum on top of that. So those are the different protocols. And uh, we're going to jump on in. Um, another thing I want to mention here is just kind of tying into that previous slide. Much like we troubleshoot networks, we kind of have three different areas of focus, right? We have everything in the middle, which we call the network. And then we have our two endpoints, the client and the server. And the attack that he just described and kind of some misconceptions is, is you can attack a network in the same way that you could analyze and troubleshoot a network. You could attack it at the server, you could attack it at the client, you could attack it along the network. BGP hijacking was an example of attacking along the network. Um, writing malicious code that sidesteps something or you know, does a buffer overflow would be an example of attacking the client. Now attacking the server, there's some interesting things to think about. You brought up a, um, I think a hardware wallet in the beginning. You had a good question about a hardware wallet. But you think about if you're leveraging an exchange or a third party to host your private keys for you so that you only log in with a password to interact with the blockchain, you need to do your third party risk analysis. You need to think about that uh, in depth, about how much do you trust that third party and how much responsibility do you want to put on them. There's some classic examples of Mt. Gox, which is a big exchange, and some others that have gotten breached, the the cryptocurrency is stolen, and those people can never recover that. Because once it goes from one, pri or one public key to another, and that transaction is valid as being a valid transaction, it never gets replayed. We talked about that. You're baking in this massively robust, resilient linked list that you can't just go and change a block back in time to update it. Once it happens, it happens. It's written to the, uh, to the, to the ledger. So just think about that as we kind of go through this and, and describe these things. So kicking off here, peer-to-peer -peer has kind of three subsections underneath it. We have a connection, we have initial block download, and we have a relay. And this is all about building our mesh network. This is how we get meshy, all right? So we're going to jump in here. And um, this, this stuff happens anytime we come up online. Anytime our wallet's offline, wants to kind of kick back on during the network. This happens on the initial bootstrapping process for a node joining the, uh, the, the Bitcoin network or the cryptocurrency network. And um, this is basically how you bootstrap somebody, bring them up to speed, and get them to be a participating, functioning node onto the network. All right, so here we go, sequence diagrams. As promised, might be a little bit hard to see from the back. Hopefully, you pulled up um, the website we had showed in the beginning. Um, do you want to just, should we call that out real quick? 
It was openonelabs.com. Slash SharkFest 2018. So that way you can kind of look at these sequence diagrams as we're clicking through them. You can look at those up close. All right, so here we go. Node A is going to join this network and it's going to throw out a version, the block that they currently have in their inventory in a time. And uh, the following slide is a PCAP of this, but we're just going to kind of talk through the bounce diagram real quick. Node B is going to say, look at this version and say, do I support this? Now this kind of equates back to a TLS handshake or an SSL where we're, we're agreeing upon a cipher suite that we're going to talk for for this section. This is very much like that. We're going to agree upon a version of the protocol that we're going to talk. Node B sends back a version acknowledgement and it's also going to advertise what version it wants to talk on, the current blocks in its inventory and a time hack. Node A does this quick version act and then it sends back a response based off of Node B's inventory and it's going to say, I'm sorry, Based off of, um, it's going to send a response back once it's agreed upon the, the session, the version control. It's going to say, I want a list of all your peers. It's basically like, hey, give me your LinkedIn network. I want it all at once so I can learn about who your latest and greatest friends are. So that's a get addresses request. Uh, Node B comes back and says, hey, I have this many peers, this many friends, and these are their addresses. And um, Node A is going to come back and say, um, I would like those. It updates them and then it advertises this list back to Node B. So there's kind of a handshake process there where you kind of, you know, kind of like dogs sniffing in a park, you kind of sniff each other out real quick, you figure out who's who, and you're like, okay, got it. We, we, we know who each other are and we know each other's friends are. So this is what the version messes look like after we did our capture off the Docker container. It's running, joining the network, bootstrapping in. And um, you can see up top here, the top red portion is the protocol version that's a, that they're advertising. And you can see that, um, off the initial bootstrap process here, there's, there's going to be a hard-coded node in there, right? So you can think of this almost like an Etsy host file. Or there's something hard-coded that you're reaching out to, whether you, you know, manually forcing in a network gateway, very similar concept. I need to bootstrap you. I need to at least point you in the right direction to get you going on this network. And that's what's happening here. It's reaching out to an address. It's going over that port. And the last thing that we're advertising here is that, that block inventory. And we're saying we have nothing in our inventory. We're a noob. First time on the network, you got to help me out. And the next part of that we had kind of talked through there was the get address message. Now, when we were looking into this for the first time, uh, we had no idea what packet magic was. So to save you all some research trouble, we kind of did a little deep dive into it. And packet magic kind of addresses two problems. Their first one is, is as you have a stream of bits kind of flowing through, that this application is processing, it needs a delimiter to know when a packet starts for the Bitcoin transactions. That's what packet magic is doing. So it also addresses which network it's riding on. So for anybody that's running a robust network where you have a production environment, a dev environment, a test environment, and maybe you're, you know, you get some Q&A or smoke testing, you know, kind of all stood up in your DevOps pipeline, who knows how crazy you're getting nowadays. There's a lot of neat stuff going on. But that's exactly what's happening here. They have many different test networks, many different production networks where they're trying and rolling out new features, and you can join those, and your packet magic is going to be different for each of those networks. Now, this one is for the production network, and it's letting the parser know for a node that, hey, this is a Bitcoin packet that needs to be chopped, delimiter, and starting there. It's very similar if you're looking at files on a Linux system. There's always going to be some way to denote the type of file in the beginning of it that you start inspecting. So that's our get address message. Next up here is address message. Now for this one, <coughs> node B is advertising back to node A that it has one other peer, count of one, and this is the new peer's address and also the agreed upon port. Now we're kind of highlighting ports for you all because as we go through this, we're going to build out some indicators for you all to take back to your networks, uh, whether you're doing analysis or maybe even troubleshooting your own mining rig if you work at a company that's doing Bitcoin mining and different cryptocurrency mining. So, we're just going to call out some of these things that we, we notice as we're doing our analysis. All right, so now that we are up and peered with our friend, we're going to start doing the initial block download. We're going to start syncing our inventories. Now, the first one that Node A is going to start out with is say, I'm basically starting out with a, a goose egg in my inventory of zero. And I'm going to reach out to Node B and say, do you have anything higher than zero? And hopefully you selected the right friend, because if they have a zero, then you're in trouble. And that's the whole reason why we did the bootstrapping problem, right? They're going to point you to a node that's active and known active so you can get bootstrapped onto the system. So node B, of course, is, is, is doing work and has plenty of blocks in its inventory and says, yes, I have a, uh, an inventory amount. 
I'm going to advertise that to you. And uh, you're going to kick that back to Node A. Node A says, great, I'm hungry, feed me. Okay, give me those blocks, and that's what Node B does. You can see a bunch of, after this initial get data transaction, Node B just kind of starts firing, much like uh, you know, an HTTP request, and then it starts kicking off all this information, and then you kind of get the, the, uh, the OK, everything's been delivered. That's exactly what's going on here. You request some data, Node B fires it back. Now, it's going to do up to a certain amount. And Brian kind of mentioned this um, as we were talking about standing up a node. But currently, I think uh, when I hit you the other day, you were saying about a terabyte is the size of the, the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's not fitting on your Raspberry Pi probably pretty easily. It's not fitting on your mobile device. A terabyte to bring down the entire blockchain is quite a bit. So in this thinking process, we're not going to throw everything at somebody all at once. And we're going to determine what they actually need in order to do transactions. And that's why you see this. He agreed upon maybe 500 blocks for the first transaction. If node A is still hungry, they're going to say, give me more blocks. And they're going to do that check again and say, basically, OK, now I'm up to block 500. Do you have anything greater than 500? Node B is going to say, yes or no, I have something greater than 500, and continue that syncing process. The whole idea is node A and node B kind of reach this equilibrium point. They're equal players on the playing field, and they're both able to kind of carry weight in this system. They're, they're achieving this full meshiness and they're both going to be productive members on the system. So this process repeats until done. And here's what it looks like. Um, we're going to skip the, uh, the initial one, which is give me your inventory, because it's just very simple. And we're going to dive right into node B advertising back. Here's what my inventory is. So again, calling out that packet magic number, it's the same thing as we saw last time. It's just saying, that, hey, this is a Bitcoin transaction on the production network. And the inventory message that B is advertising is a count of two. So it has two blocks. And it gives the hashes for both of those. Node A responds, I'm hungry, give it to me, all right? So here's what we do. It says, give me a count of one. And it, it recognizes uh, that hash number and says, would you please send me that block? So rinse and repeat until everybody's synced up. For that scenario, it, only, it will, would have only happened two times for two blocks. The next piece here is the relay process. And this is what we use to propagate new transactions on the network. And it's also used to kind of validate uh, inventory messages between nodes. And so uh, in one scenario, Brian talked about how we might be you know, doing surfboard transactions. And they're happening from all over the place, you know, Southern California all the way out to Spain and France. So this is an idea here where we're generating new transactions. They get validated. And, and somewhere in here, you're going to have somebody doing some checks. But node A may have a different peer kind of way over here. And at some point, you may circumvent and get information to propagate over here to node C. At, at some point, node B may not know what node A and node C know, just because of that's how a mesh network works. You know, when we talk about you know, routing loops and um, asymmetrical paths and, and, and networking, this, this kind of throws a lot of those conventions out the window because your whole idea is to increase resiliency and redundancy of information so that it can't be manipulated at a single point of failure. So here we may have many different paths to reach node A, B, and C, and that is by design. That is, a mesh network wants to propagate traffic, very chatty, and uh, there's a lot of checking that involves in order to deconflict those messages at some point. So that's also why we have 10 minute, uh, you know, actually, it's, is it an hour right now? 10 minutes, 10 minutes for resolving a transaction. So th there is some latency built into it. And we'll get into, you know, this isn't the 100% solution. It's just a very interesting solution for how to solve these problems. 10 minutes isn't usable for you to go out and, and try and buy something with your, with your mobile device. We're used to instantaneous Apple Pay to go get our Starbucks coffee in the morning. So this is um, just like anything that's being engineered and built. You don't get to 100% solution overnight. Now, because you don't get the 100% solution overnight, that doesn't diminish the value or the credibility of the technology underneath the hood. It's just getting into kind of how to work those bugs out. So keep that in mind as we talk through this stuff. We're, we're kind of staying neutral. We're not getting on a soapbox saying one is better than the other, or you should do this or shouldn't. It's just an investigation of the technology and why it's interesting. So this is the whole relay piece. And because we didn't leave our node up long enough uh, to get to this point and start doing this transaction, we're going to go ahead and skip through to API. API is interesting because this is essentially how your wallet is going to boot up and talk to something, pull down its balance, and come offline. The API allows you to make certain calls to systems. And it's going to be done at the JSON RPC level. And it's going to come in the form of an HTML request. Uh, HTTP request, sorry. Um, 
It's going to come in the form of, uh, it's going to say, for this scenario here, client is going to be a new wall that gets set up. Yep. I was going to get you the, the microphone. Excuse me? Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. You got it. So API, application program interface, it's, um, what would be a good example of a, of a wallet interacting with So, the, so yeah. an ex it, it, like I think I mentioned earlier, if you're participating in this thing, you can participate as you know, a person, you can participate as an Internet of Things device or a piece of software, right? So the, uh, the developers of these blockchains are developing uh, APIs so that if you want to write software that interacts with this, you have a, uh, an interface that you can use and it's standardized in, across the board. So most of these have, uh, I think all of them that I've seen, have some semblance of an API and a lot of them are based off of kind of an original Bitcoin API. So yeah, it's nothing more than a, a set of uh, JSON RPC message uh, messages that you can uh, push and receive, send and receive from a, from a blockchain. So we have a, uh, a wallet that's coming up online for the first time, and uh, what we're actually doing here, we're going out to node, node A. So the example that I used the other day, and I think kind of works pretty well, is you're a bartender that's out here serving us drinks in the evening. And you're doing a good job, and you want to receive tips. And maybe the easiest way for you to receive tips is to put a little graphic up there of your um, Bitcoin address so somebody can kind of scan it to you or send you a tip. So in order to do that, they're going to create an account specifically for SharkFest. It's going to be called SharkFest 2018, and they're going to make that new wallet. So it's going to reach out to its bootstrapping node. The node is going to respond to that. This is an API call, and it's going to give it back its address. And at this point, the wallet has no other reason to be on the network. And in fact, when you think about network vulnerabilities, it doesn't make any sense to have this wallet only do the one function if it's storing something critical. If it's storing money and it has your private key on it, you probably don't want to leave that thing hanging out there on a server, open to a bunch of different vulnerabilities, getting scanned by bots. So you basically bring your wallet down offline, whatever form it is. So you disconnect it. Now, at some point throughout the day, we have some transactions occurring. And maybe Brad gets done talking today and... Uh, it's 5 o'clock somewhere when I get done from here, so I'm going to go get a beer. We've got the beer stand set up, and I want to tip this bartender. So I tip the bartender to his account. Now, the question that occurs now is, well, how do I get the funds to the account if the wallet's offline? Well, kind of sporadically, you'll go back. This wallet will connect back online, and it's going to reach back out to its node over JSON RPC, and it's going to ask them to update their balance. So it's very similar to kind of going out to your bank on your web app. Your bank is keeping a balance inventory for you as things come and go from it. This is very much the same scenario, except all you're doing is you're connecting to Node. This could be any node in the blockchain. It's not a centralized bank that you're going to check to. This could be Node A through Z, N plus 1, however you want to look at it, anywhere all over the world, depending on who you're talking to, to get your balance, because your balance and transactions have propagated throughout the network and been updated. So that's kind of the important part about this, this, this call here. So what does this look like? As promised, the, the request goes out, and um, basically what we're doing here is we're going to ask for a new address as kind of the, uh, the method call, and we're going to make our SharkFest 2018 wallet from this, uh, from this API call. And the result that comes back from our node is basically the unique identifier and kind of the, the resultant in the OK. So at this point, whatever system that we're interacting with through the API, we're asking for a new address, and we're being granted that new address. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I want to just emphasize a point here. You'll, uh, two points, actually, with this. Uh, one being, again, if you're, let's say you're, you're doing this from your laptop, and you're connecting to a remote node somewhere that's, like Brad said, it could be anywhere in the world. That means this traffic's going across the public internet in clear text. So again, I'm, if I'm able to somehow associate Brad's IP address to Brad, now I can associate wallet addresses to IP addresses to Brad. So this stuff is not necessarily anonymous. The second point I want to point out, or the second thing I want to point out is that string in the result there at the bottom. So when I mentioned earlier that you're using you know, public key cryptography to generate these addresses, um, in, in many cases they're, they're, doing some sort, they're doing some interesting concatenation and truncation of these, of these resulting uh, uh, strings to form kind of unique identifiers for addresses, uh, which gives you an ability as an analyzer to, de to detect and determine types of patterns going across your network and, and things like that will, will show up again in, in our indicators. But again, it's a, it's a very kind of oddly sized, shaped, uh, I'd fingerprinted it's strings coming across the network. You got a question out there, yes, sir? Do we use something like the core network? Because that's how that's affected. So that, yep. that, excellent point. 
So I'll, I'll just, did, you, did everybody get to hear that? Yeah. The question was, if I use something, Onion Routing or like the Tor Network to obfuscate kind of these, uh, these calls and this traffic, how does that affect us? So that's a uh, often recommended use case for this. If you want to add an additional level of security for these types of networks, use something like Tor or Covery or I2P or whatever, right? Um, by default, they're not using that, or many of them are not. There are certain cryptocurrencies, I think, that have uh, that functionality built into the software as it's running. But as it's uh, traversing node to node, it's, by default, many of these are not using any sort of um, even, even TLS. So, but yeah, that is, a, that is a often recommended feature if you're concerned about anonymity and privacy using this type of, using these systems. And we didn't go into the pros and cons yet, so we'll, get to, we'll probably get that to the end. But um, you know, this is a Bitcoin transaction. This is basically a follow TCP stream and Wireshark. Um, this looks differently if you were to use Monero and you were to use some of these other different kind of add-ons to what Bitcoin has become. So just like you know, V1, V2, V3 of software, there's folks out there that are trying to solve these problems in a usable way. And that's kind of one of the, um, the main principles of, of Monero. So I think we hammered that, got the API calls down. You got an example of what that may look like. I like Brian's point right here of if you get really crafty with regex searches, um, one that we might be able to do is a frame matches or a frame contains. But a frame matches, you know, this many characters, we know that they're going to get spit back in some kind of random fashion. You can kind of start to build out some interesting watchers and alerts. So that's, that's always a good one to think about. Um, moving on here to mining. This is our last one that we're going to cover for our, um, our, our network traffic types. So for this one, we, the key thing that the miner is doing is basically getting some type of information to do some kind of brute first work on it. It has to do its proof of work. So here the miner is, is reaching out to a pool in this scenario. And it has an address, its password to join the pool, and what kind of work it wants to do. Everybody not, might not be bringing the same tool bag to work that day. One may be you know, hanging drywall. One may be doing concrete. So you got to think of it in terms of that. There's many different ways to come to this this pool and, and be a participant. One may be bringing CPUs, one's doing GPUs, one has ASICs. And then there may be some massive hyper pool out there that's only a bunch of data centers that are pulling together to do some really big problems as, as a team. So there's different ways to kind of form and build out your, your work crew for the day. So that's what we're doing here in this, in this agreement section. The pool comes back with an acknowledgement of your subscription, your request to join. It's gonna give you some kind of difficulty based on the tools you bring to that pool. And it's going to give you your first job with some nonsense to start with. And going back to Brian's discussion on why that's important is your difficulty level of the problem that you need to solve, the randomness in which you want to inject into that and start at and basically start your brute force iteration, which is exhaustion of the key space, kind of just step one crank, step two crank, and just increasing on the key space. That's a brute force approach. Um, so that's what it's going to do. Now your miner gets this information, and it's going to churn. And it's going to churn until it's found a solution or it gets a new update. So in this scenario here, we get our, our project, we churn, and we get a solution. Now, as, just as a quick reminder, the solution is not a collision with the hash, right? So the, the purpose of a hash is that it's one-wayness and that you can't find another way to get that same hash value. That would be a collision. That would be an insecure hashing algorithm if you can easily find a collision. What we're trying to do is just find, kind of find this idea that we have X amount of zeros in the beginning to start with. Or you know, you're kind of doing a, how do you describe it? A less than or equal to uh, type of value. So you're not actually solving the hash and finding a collision by brute forcing. All right, so it shares this to the pool. The miner updates kind of your work. And it keeps kind of a, I guess, a record book or a tally book on what it, it's going to pay out to you at whatever kind of dividend rates you want, you know, weekly, hourly, monthly, that type of thing, how you want to collect from the pool. So this is what it looks like. Again, JSON RP, RPC. It's going to go out as a request. And you can see up there in the red, this is the miner going out saying, hey, these are my login parameters. Um, you get to see an advertisement right here of the, you know, it's coming with a CPU for this. So it's, a, it's joining as a CPU. That's what it's bringing for the, uh, the workload that day. And uh, here we go, calling that out. The uh, mining pool returns back basically this block of information. And that's its job description, if you're parsing that out, OK? So that's its job description. Now, right here, this next block of red is basically the miner working on this previous job. Miner's working on it. It finds a solution. It submits it back to the pool. That's what that next transaction is. Now, interesting, you don't see that again the rest of the time here. This is an example of the miner 
uh, receives a new message right here from the pool, and it starts to work, and it doesn't find anything. And then the pool updates it again, updates it again, updates it again. So basically, the problem that it kicked out to that miner to do, it was resolved or found by somebody else, so it gives it a new job to do. It's like, hey, thanks for trying. Um, I want to get you onto a new task so you can be productive. So that's what's occurring here in this capture. The, um, the miner, if it's not giving a solution, it's just kind of churning until it gets an update from the system. So that, that could, that's kind of, kind of that. Maybe, maybe you don't get the, the new work and you submit a share before you get a new job and someone else has already solved that and the, you know, latency in the network can solve that. So yeah, you'll get a reject, potentially rejected share in that instance, yes. So, sorry, his question was, what happens if you're mining and you get, the, you get these rejected shares messages, um, which essentially just means that you submitted a response that somebody else submitted before you? Well, I thought you were going to give me a longer water break than that. I'm going to run my mouth too long here. Awesome. So the whole purpose of that is to give you guys some indicators. Um, we're walking through this uh, from the perspective of how are we tackling this in Wireshark, how are we tackling this as um, you know, maybe defenders on the network, as blue teams. Um, and we're also tackling it from maybe you want to do your own stuff and you want to troubleshoot it. All right? So these are the indicators and things that you should be looking for. For this part right here, we broke things down into two, two pieces that we did analysis on, Monero and Bitcoin. You'll recognize this port because we've kind of been calling it all out throughout the slides. That's for Bitcoin. That's the port that's connected to for peer-to-peer. -peer. The top one here, 18,080 is for Monero, so that's a TCP port. For the API calls um, for Monero, it was 8,332. And for Monero, it's 18,081. And that would just be a real quick way if you had a capture and you were just curious to see if something was going on in the network. That is the default bootstrapping of a node to talk to the network. So if nobody goes in and plays with any of the configs, this is how you're going to see most of this traffic going out and reaching out to Monero pools uh, or Bitcoin type stuff. These are not default, or I'm sorry, these are not hard and fast rules. So these could be changed on a command line with a simple flag that says I want to talk to a new pool on this port or something else. That's so something to kind of keep in mind. You're going to have to stack indicators together, maybe kind of do some, some Boolean operations on it, some anding, some oring type ideas. But this is a way to kind of build out maybe your search queries. The next one is mining. Uh, again, same thing goes for this port. Specific mining pools will be on uh, different ports. This one was port XMR. Okay, XMR. And uh, so that's kind of a classic one to kind of jump onto. Lots of documentaries and how-tos on how to get onto it. So that, that would be a popular one to look for. Uh, one of the ones that I'm looking at right here for a, a good regex would be frame matches, JSON RPC, or XMR, or pool type field. If you're, if you're parsing through stuff and the frame contains that, it's, it's a solid hit that it's going to be reaching out to some of these pools. Another one to look at would be a DNS query name matches. And we're going to talk about this one in a second, but this is kind of an in-browser mining opportunity, and that's through CoinHive. So that's just some food for thought. If you're interested in looking on your networks, you're in the NetOps Center, these might be some good things to key in on. All right, so now we're kind of boiling it all down together. We talked about the foundations. We talked about what makes up these Bitcoin networks. We talked about what the traffic looks like. Now we want to know why is this important to us as engineers, as operations, as you know, folks sitting in the security operations centers. Why do we care about this stuff? And my whole rationale is you've got to follow the money. So it's really interesting when we look at um, what the bad guys are doing, what malicious actors are doing, because they're very good at developing business use cases because they have a lot of resources, and they're only going to put those resources onto things that make them money. That's the whole point of their business. They're making money, and they're, they're spending all this development time on malware to go out and recoup that time spent on dev work. So if we follow what they're doing, we just look at the market. In 2017, our market blew up 20-fold, from 18 billion to over 600 billion US dollars. At this point, it became lucrative to compromise systems and by compromising a system, we're going to access the computational resources on that system in order to mine. That's the whole purpose of what they're doing right now. And one of the, the neat things about this is, un, unlike ransomware, where you're basically locking down a network, encrypting their data, and trying to make them pay for it to release that information to them, this is a little bit of just a nuisance. This is like that gnat flying around your face and just kind of bugging you at the campfire. Because 
unless you hear your fan kicking on and you're spiking the CPU to 100%, you may not be noticing an impact performance right away. Um, you may not even be monitoring correctly so you know that your data center is actually working a little bit harder than it needs to and utilization has gone through the roof. So in, in all aspects, if you're monitoring really well, you may be able to catch it, but for, for most, it's probably just a nuisance and they're not catching it right away because the impact isn't seen right away. And really all that's occurring is somebody's hijacking your resources to become a mining operator, spin on some problems, and kick those solutions back out to their address or their pool or whatever they're running. So if we follow the money, we see that it's become more interesting to do crypto jacking and mining as you compromise resources. And we're going to give a nod here to Brad, who does, uh, he had a great little article and, and called out some information on uh, basically some Monero um, mining that was going on after it was, it was being delivered through, uh, through this loader up here. So I'd encourage you to go out, check out his, his website up there, malwaretrafficanalysis.net. Uh, he does a great little breakdown, very similar to kind of what, what we were looking at. It's just giving you some food for thought and indicators on how to look at these problems. Um, he's trying to get you to, to think about what might be coming across your network in forms of traffic, and uh, this is a great example of what he's seeing out in the wild and being submitted through his channels. Some other examples of what's going on out there is, is different methods of delivery. This one's delivered through an iframe. And the, the interesting thing about this one is that the iframe has something embedded, photo.source, which is making another redirect call out to somewhere else to bring down a binary executable in order to do Monero mining. And the, the interesting thing is as you dissect these things and you look at what they're reaching out to, it's basic, they're not even getting too crafty when they bring in these executables. They're bringing down the basic Monero um, executable, it's going over the standard ports and it's reaching back out, and all their hard coding is basically their, their public key to transfer the funds to once a solution is found. So th there's not a lot of obfuscation going on in what they're doing with the binary. They're just simply trying to, to leverage this in a multi-stage attack. So they're finding a vulnerability, they're exploiting it, and the dropper that they're putting on there afterwards is basically, instead of going out and spidering through the network and locking it down with ransomware, they're saying, go out, spider the network, and give me some resources so I can mine. So that's an example of delivery. The next one that we have here is um, Edelka's botnet, and this is kind of a cool one. So this botnet is extremely aggressive on scanning the internet, and it's looking for the, um, the eternal blue and the double pulsar ex exploits. So shadow brokers drop some interesting stuff. These are uh, these were awesome on the pen test until they started getting blocked. SMB vulnerabilities over TCP port 445. And what this, uh, this botnet is doing, and what these researchers did, is they stood up uh, basically a, a VM that was vulnerable to this eternal blue exploit. Within 20 minutes of this thing being live on the network, Edelka's bot would scan, find this thing, compromise it, and it would be mining within 20 minutes. It would be mining back to some Monero pool. So they took this thing down, they rinsed and repeated this experiment probably about five times, and consistently within 20 minutes, this bot was finding their new IP, their new vulnerable VM, and they were exploiting it. So it was pretty impressive to see how active this bot was scanning and ultimately what it was doing to make money. All right. Oh, yeah, I was being cheeky. Have to, have to dig into who the shadow brokers are and what they leaked. Um, so CryptoJacking 4 here. Um, this one's using Apache Struts phone, which is uh, delivering some Java Java web application, it's a framework. And again, they're, they're kind of second stage of this is once they execute that vulnerability, they're now going to Eternal Blue to kind of pivot and move throughout the networks. Um, so this is just an example again of in the past here, this is really getting pervasive and it's something we kind of need to keep an eye on. Um, I think that covers it for that one. I think we're good. Wrapping up here, drive-by mining. As promised, we're gonna hit the CoinHive one. So this is actually something fun to do on your free time. You can go out to CoinHive and just mine through your browser. What's gonna happen is you're gonna bring down some JavaScript through the browser, and you're just gonna reach out here basically to a mining pool where you're just gonna use your CPU resources to go out and mine for a little bit. You're not gonna get rich doing this, but just kind of a fun toy experiment to see what happens and what can be done through the browser and through JavaScript. Um, this is more just a, as an awareness you know, this, this really isn't a huge impact. It might turn on your fan on your computer, so it's not like it's, it's, it's malicious, uh, I guess. But if somebody is embedding this in their website and you don't know about it, that could be considered malicious. Um, some actual bloggers and, um, and article writers, some journalists, are actually almost like the cookie warning that gets splashed in front of your face as you visit a website. They're saying, hey, 
in order to visit my site and read my articles, I'm gonna, you're giving me permission to mine in the background of your session. And so they might make a couple cents on the dollar or something crazy like that. And, you know, as, as they're reading their blog for about 20 minutes, cruising through the articles, this thing might be mining as a reward or a tip for the blog writer. So it's kind of an interesting use case. It's not very practical, um, but it is out there and it's something to be aware of. So we consider that drive-by mining through the browser. And uh, a great way to look for this within the DNS standard query field is, uh, you know, maybe doing a, a regex parse for CoinHive, which is a very popular one. And um, I think that does about it for the indicators, huh? So at this point, I think we pretty much, uh, we're right on time here. We've got about four minutes left. We'll open it up for, uh, for any questions. Hope you enjoyed the talk. And uh, you got anything, Brian? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to emphasize one of the things, uh, so Brad mentioned a few times that we did analysis using Bitcoin and Monero. And the reason we did a, a Monero is because this is frequently one of the uh, cryptocurrencies used by uh, ransom, or by the crypto jacking tooling and this drive-by mining tooling because it's, um, you can still use it, you can still mine with it using CPUs. Uh, and it's, again, it's one of those, uh, one of those instances where it has perfectly valid use cases and has now been widely adopted by, you know, malicious actors because of its, you know, technical functionality. So, uh, that's, that's just, a just to kind of give you a heads up, it's not necessarily malicious. It's just that's uh, a great point. It's widely the, used the by technology uh, isn't actors. inherently bad. Yes. It's there's many different ways to use technology, and we know that from how the, the internet is used on a daily basis. So it's something to be aware of and understand how this technology is leveraged. Question. Sure. Give me an idea what a Bitcoin transaction costs these days. Uh, uh, an example of what a Bitcoin transaction process cost. Yeah. Okay. Example so, of like what is like ETH gas cost to do a transaction or a Bitcoin? Did you say cost or what? Cost. It, what does it cost in terms of like dollars? Like my understanding is you know that. that yes. kinds of microtransactions right now because of the cost and so my is it yeah. like fifty dollars per so transaction? so the the cost so one thing exactly I didn't right get it, though. One, question. So his question is what is it for example what does it cost to do it to do a transaction so Brad wants to buy a surfboard for me using Bitcoin he's gonna pay me one Bitcoin for it what is the overall cost so you know you think about any credit card transaction there's a slight fee that's usually uh, submitted and, or usually added on and it's uh, um, pushed to the, I think, recipient of the credit card transaction. So um, we didn't talk about it in, in the brief here, but that is that also- like 2.5%. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's usually, it's, it's, usually uh, it's, it's a, a flat, oh, it's a flat fee for, for this as well. So I mentioned, uh, I'll kind of touch on a couple points here. The, you have the reward, um, and I also mentioned that there's a fixed number of coins in a system. So they also, when you do a transaction, there's a small fee associated with it. Um, which you can do to either party. So as the payee, you can sub add that fee. So if I'm paying, Brad's paying me one Bitcoin, he ends up paying me, I don't know, 1.1 Bitcoins, and I get one, and then the miner gets that reward. Um, so the actual fee is a function of a couple things. It's a function of how many people are mining on, a, on the network at any given time and how many transactions are going across. So in many of these cases, you can customize the fee that you're willing to pay. So if I want to, if I don't really care about my transaction, I don't want, I don't really care when it goes through, I may put a very, very low fee. And when Brad has his mining node set up, he can say, I'm not going to even bother trying to process any transactions that have a very, very low fee. I want a fee of a higher amount. Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head right now what the exact fee is. Um, I, if you do a quick Google search on like uh, Bitcoin network costs, there's websites that actually track that real time. So. Uh, for example, in I think January, when there was this huge speculative run up on the network, people were trying to move transactions all across, and it was taking hours and hours and hours for transactions to process. And the fees got extraordinarily high because of supply and demand. Uh, it's so, it's, it's and a really, really interesting concept because as you start doing smart contracts or you develop things on top of the blockchain, you have to think about that when you develop your, your APIs or your system because as you write and do commits and check from from the blockchain, you're gonna to have to pay, uh, an ETH is called gas, but you're basically paying a fee to access and do some work on it. Yep. And sec second point with that is uh, the, um, 
there's additionally there's that latency involved. So Bitcoin, for example, tries to use about a 10 minute window. So every 10 minutes it wants to solve one of these blocks. So if I'm a, uh, if I'm a I don't know, a, a vendor who's selling something, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm selling something expensive, maybe I'm selling a car. I wanna make sure that that block is valid and it's widely propagated throughout the network before I accept payment for that car. So Brad may, Brad may send me money for the car and 10 minutes later somebody, some block tells me that it's good. Well, I wanna make sure a bunch, of, a bunch of nodes tell me that it's good. So I'm gonna wait a little bit until that thing fully propagates throughout the network and a bunch of nodes are accepting this as, as, as gospel. So a general consensus uh, is like six transactions in Bitcoin for, or six validations in, in, uh, in Bitcoin. So it's about 60 minutes at that point. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a kind of a, a dynamic answer. Just a little question. Have you guys uh, made a profit from your mining rig? <laughs> so we live in Southern California, oh. um, which means I pay like 40 cents a kilowatt hour for power. So it was a, it was a hobby and an experiment more than a, a profit driven motivation. No, and uh, I, they've, they've since, since been dismantled due to the WAF factor. So um, yeah, I was heating my house in the winter for a little while and now that it's summertime, no. So no, it's, it's um, for the most part, it is currently not even remotely profitable to run these things at your home. People are running them in, you know, these hydro, hydro power states with low power and low cooling and massive rigs. And so it's become a very uh, commercial, commercial enterprise. So if you want to do it now, it's to do it because you find it interesting. You want to uh, uh, play with the technology. Maybe you do want to try to accumulate this because in the future you want to speculate on the value of these things um, and or you just want to support a network. So, so long answer, no, or the short answer, no. All right, this might be the last one then. Uh, what's the point of increasing the network uh, difficulty? Um, so like, for example, I know that the blockchain is not only used for crypto, uh, cryptocurrency, but it could be used for other things like, yep. let's say, um, uh, like you want to put your deed, uh, it, like, you know, you have a ledger, people start putting their deed information in there. But if the network difficulty keeps rising, just to keep a track of those, um, that data, it just would use massive amount of um, power and what uh, resources. Yep. So why would someone put data on a blockchain? Okay, so I, I heard. Does that make sense? I heard two questions there. I heard why one do, one do you increase difficulty and two why would you store data given that it's expensive to store data? Yeah. Okay, so uh, one the diff difficulties um, again it's a function of how how many miners how many people are validating these transactions how much hash power. Uh, is on the network. And the idea is, is to keep, um, it's kind of twofold. One, to prevent DOS style attacks and malicious activity. So if anybody can submit just massive amounts of information to this and validate blocks incredibly fast, it, it, it becomes uh, more likely that someone would be able to conduct some sort of denial attack on this thing. Two, it's to keep kind of a stability within the network. So like I keep mentioning the Bitcoin example. They want to validate a transaction every 10 minutes, or validate a block every 10 minutes. Uh, so by art, they, that's at a level of abstraction in there that allows them to uh, kind of adjust the, the the, adjust um, the amount of time it takes so that they can kind of maintain that 10 minute window, which adds kind of stability and uh, makes a valid latency in the network. That way, if a bunch of people you know, leave the, the Bitcoin network, for example, I think uh, China a few years ago uh, outlawed some of this stuff and there was kind of a massive drop off for a time, it can, uh, reduce difficulty and therefore keep that block time at 10 minutes rather than it all of a sudden jumping up to an hour. So it, it's, a, it's, it's a level of abstraction that kind of keeps the network more stable. Uh, to answer your second question, if okay. we got... Yeah, oh. perfect. I was going to say one thing we didn't jump into is you're getting into the, the question, I think you might be addressing it, sorry, but you're, you're looking at what is the, the use case for the blockchain and we really get into public, private, and you know, semi-public, semi-private. So it may, it may make more sense, for example, in a, um, a supply management system to have that be a private network. You already trust the parties. The nodes have already been kind of synced and they're trusted and validated. There you could write a bunch of information, a bunch of information on the ledger, you know, parts, expensive bin item numbers, that type of thing. And that's kind of where the research is going into in the public blockchain area. Um, you're right, on, on a, I'm sorry, on a private. On a public, it, it is different, especially as you're paying costs and that thing has to propagate throughout a network and everybody has to share the load of that and bring it down. So that is one of the big challenges yep. with the blockchain is size control and what do you want to put on it. And that really gets challenging as you look at the Ethereum 
uh, blockchain because they're writing smart contracts, which has what we call a Turing complete system where it's actually able to be a fully comprised computer that's able to crank and run some algorithm and spit out something from it. So it's executable. And so that, you know, that makes it more heavy. It's, it's heavier to hold, for sure. Yeah, so, so, to, so to reiterate one of Brad's points earlier, this stuff is still very much you know, version zero dot something. Uh, so people are actively trying to solve that, pr that exact problem of how can, you, how can you use these things for storage and make them less expensive and more usable. So there's, there's multiple types of uh, underlying data structures. I, I think I brought up Nano earlier. Um, so that one doesn't use a, a kind of a linked list blockchain structure. It uses something called a dis directed acyclic graph, which gives it a whole bunch of different types of properties. So people are, are, are thinking through these problems and trying to solve uh, or maybe something. even, I guess, the sharding use case. Correct? Sharding is another uh, kind of interesting use case people are trying to do with this. Uh, and Take then, discrete chunks and spread them out all over the world. You can kind of bring them back together. Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, very math, math heavy, very interesting stuff going on in this space to try and solve those complex problems. Yeah, good questions. I think that about wraps yep. it up, folks. We appreciate you. Yep, thank you.